the heart of creating a layout for fabrication is placement and routing. It is the most critical and most complicated step in the design flow. So after synthesis, we have a netlist, and that netlist is a VHDL file that consists of uh, structural connections of standard cells from the standard cell library. The next two steps are called partitioning and floor planning, and they are uh, connected to each other, and they're also connected to the steps that follow. In partitioning and floor planning, we ask ourselves the question of, is the design a singular unity, or can it be partitioned into blocks that are more or less logically connected to each other? Uh, by that, for example, if you have a microprocessor, the microprocessor is divided into an ALU, a control unit, and a memory unit. If you have a transceiver or a radio, the radio is divided into a transmitter and a receiver. So does it make sense from a hardware implementation point of view to say that the design is partitioned into these two partitions, the transmitter and the receiver? If the answer is yes, then we are going to partition the design. And we determine the number of part partitions and we define them. Floor planning means that once we have decided on the partitions, we have the real estate of the ASIC, and we now have to decide which areas of the uh, ASIC are dedicated to which partitions. So for example, here we are dedicating this area to partition A, this area to partition B, and this area to partition C. And so you can see that partitioning and floor planning are connected to each other. Whether or not partitioning and floor planning makes sense, because sometimes you might choose to uh, leave the design as a singular unity, but whether or not that makes sense is actually related to place and route, which is the main step that we have to deal with next. So in synthesis, we have decided the shopping list of standard cells that we are gonna use to build our circuit. So we have decided the number of instances of each of the standard cells we are using, and also how they are logically connected to each other to form the overall circuit. We also obtained uh, an estimate for delay, including specifically gate delays. In placement and routing, what we're gonna do is we are gonna take the um, layouts of each of the standard cells we are using, and we are gonna place them in specific locations in the ASIC and then we are going to route them to each other using metal layers so that we have the overall layout of the entire circuit. And so if you ask, ask yourself, how do we manage the complexity of a very large circuit consisting of millions of transistors? We do not, actually. The tool will place and route the mini layouts of the standard cells, and so we end up with the overall layout. So again, uh, a standard cell layout consists of rows of um, cells that have the same height or the same pitch, but different width. The standard cell rows are separated by metal tracks, and these metal tracks are used for horizontal uh, routing. Vertical routing between metal tracks or even between cells can be provided by higher metal layers. And so when we talk about placement and routing, these are two operations, but they are inseparable. They are also um, iterative, so they might have to be done several times. So let's look at this example. Uh, in this example, we have a bunch of uh, standard cells, 30 standard cells. So this is a very small example because, you know, we're dealing with a very limited number of cells. And we have performed placement and routing for all of the cells, uh, except we also need to connect cell number 4 to cell number 30. So this is the remaining uh, routing that we have not done. However, to connect cell 4 to cell 30, we have to use a horizontal metal track. And if we are going to do that, we have run out of horizontal metal tracks in the first row of jumpers. And so we cannot connect cell 4 to cell 30. Of course, this is a very simplified view of what is happening. But it shows us that the placement tool has finished its job and that yet when the uh, routing tool goes in to try and, and do its job, it fails to do so. 
The placement and routing tool will not then report a failure to the, to the designer. Instead, they will try again. So the routing tool informs the placement tool that it cannot close all the routings necessary. The placement tool will ask itself a question. What happens if I exchange a couple of, of cells to give the, uh, the uh, routing tool the chance to perform its routing? For example, what if we move cell 4 to cell 24 and cell 24 to cell 4, for example? In that case, we have opened a horizontal metal track in the second row of metal tracks that can connect uh, cell 4 to cell 30. In fact, cell 4 and cell 30 are now in the same row and can probably communicate without even the need for a horizontal track. So, of course, this is dependent on uh, the move not affecting cell 24 uh, in a negative way by making its routing impossible. Now, this is a very simplistic view because it, it ignores uh, a, a bunch of things about placement and routing, which is that placement and routing doesn't actually function without constraints. Constraints are a very important part of the design. And constraints mean, specifically, they mean uh, demands that the designer makes of the tool. So the designer wants the tool to be able to... Uh, implement the design, and at the same time produce results that fit within a certain set of constraints. So constraints usually fall uh, under either pin placement constraints, and this are these are very simple. We are defining the pins of the, uh, of the uh, chip, uh, so that this pin is VDD, this pin is ground, and so on. Um, another constraint could be uh, the aspect ratio of the chip and that means how, uh, how wide it is relative to how high it is. Because sometimes the tool can actually fit a chip within a certain area, but it's going to produce a very strange um, aspect ratio, like a chip that is much higher than it is wide or much wider than it is high. But the usual constraints we talk about are area and speed. These are the uh, two most important constraints we impose upon the design. A design could be constrained either in area only or in speed only or in both. So if the design is only area constrained, then we are telling the tool to try to fit the design within a certain area. And after doing that, to try and make the circuit work as fast as possible. So try to extract the highest speed from the chip once you have fitted it within uh, the specified area. If the uh, design is only speed constrained, then that means that we want it to perform at a certain speed, to have a certain clock frequency, and we don't care about the area. So you can use whatever area you want, just make it work this fast. Most designs are actually constrained in both area and speed. And so in that case, we are telling the design, the, the tool, to fit the design within a certain area and ensure that it is working at a certain speed. What does speed mean? Speed specifically means clock frequency. And spe speed specifically means clock period. So we are trying to ensure that the design can function within a certain clock period. So if we look at the example given up here, this is an example that is area constrained so that the area shown is the area available. And it is also speed constrained so that we are demanding a clock period of seven nanoseconds. So every path has to close within 7 nanoseconds. Everything has to finish within 7 nanoseconds. Assume for a second that a path consists of only the two cells that we are connecting to each other. So that path 1 consists of this cell, and it is connected to this cell through this path. right? And we are showing three delays. The delay of the interconnects, the path delay, the delay of the final cell and the delay of the first cell. And so path one overall is going to have a delay of eight nanoseconds because it takes six nanoseconds in the gates and two nanoseconds in the path. Whereas path two, for example, has one nanosecond in the first gate and five nanoseconds in the final gate, which means that synthesis would have concluded that it has a delay of six nanoseconds, but it has a delay of 1.5 nanoseconds in, uh, the, in, in routing. And so it's going to have a delay of 7.5 nanoseconds. 
when, when we look at path 3, for example, it has a delay of 3 nanoseconds in the first cell and 3 nanoseconds in the, uh, in the second cell and 1 nanosecond in uh, interconnect for a total delay of 7 nanoseconds. And so path 4 has 2 nanoseconds in the first cell and 2 in the final cell and 3 in interconnect for a total delay of 7 nanoseconds. So when we look at these four paths, for example, and let's assume uh, that the clock is actually 7.5 nanoseconds, not 7 nanoseconds, we will find that path 2, 3, and 4 are going to pass. And what do we mean by pass? We mean that they will fit within the uh, speed constraint that we have imposed, the 7.5 nanoseconds. Whereas path 1 is not going to fit. Its delay is longer than the constraint we have imposed. How do we report this? We report this through a set of slacks. We say that we have positive slacks for path 3 and 4, we have zero slack for path 2, and we have negative slack for path 1. The tool is not going to give up just yet. It's going to make a, an attempt to make path 1 finish with positive slack or at least zero slack. It's going to do this by trying to replace the cell. So it's going to replace this cell to the top row. This makes the routing delay shorter. It reduces it to one nanoseconds, which allows path, path uh, one to finish within seven nanoseconds. This gives path one a positive slack of 0.5 nanoseconds. At this point, the placement, placement and routing tool can report back to the designer and say that it has managed to achieve closure. Closure means that it has found a solution, a layout, which gives you positive slack or zero slack for all the path. On the other hand, if the placement and routing tool fails to find closure, and it will keep trying for a number of times, this, this number of times, this number of iterations, are usually defined by the tool. Uh, the designer defines them as something called uh, optimization effort, for example. And so the tool is going to keep trying for maybe a number of times or may for maybe some period of time, after which it will give up. If it gives up, it will uh, report failure to close to the designer. And when it does so, it will also report uh, the negative slacks, or actually all the slacks in the circuit, and specifically the negative slacks that it failed to close. So then the designer has an idea of which path have negative slacks, and they can probably fix them. So what are the outputs from placement and routing? What are the possible scenarios that we can end up with? We can end up with closure, which means that we have managed to satisfy the constraints uh, that the designer has imposed. And in that case, the designer can either accept the design or maybe try to squeeze out a little bit more performance by tightening the constraints and trying again. Or we might uh, report a failure, and a failure will be reported in terms of setup time violations and negative slacks in the path that have uh, setup time violations, in which case we can respond to failure a bunch of ways. We can try to relax uh, constraints by reducing the speed that we are demanding and seeing if we actually manage to achieve closure in this case. Or we might actually increase the uh, optimization effort of the tool, and this rarely works. Or we can revisit the design. Revisiting the design means we can go up, and usually this means going up to the HDL design uh, step, and we might actually have to break the critical path or the path, the offending path, the path that have uh, negative slacks. We have to break them by introducing internal pipelining. Uh, this creates uh, extra slack in this path, which would translate after placement and routing into uh, resolving setup time violations.